So in this video, we're going to learn how to detect heart rate in videos. So I'm going to go ahead and show you all the results. So right here in the left side is the original video, and in the right side is a video where we have actually amplified the apparent heart rate. So let's take a look at this. You can see in the left side, you can't really see anything, but the right, the face is clearly changing color. So this is a result of something called Eulerian processing. So before we get into the Eulerian processing, I just want to show you the red blue, the sum of the red, blue, and green channels that we take in the original video versus the filtered video. So in the original video, it's just almost a constant stream of values, but in the filtered one, we see a clear sinusoidal pulse that is coming from the heart rate. So what Eulerian processing is, it's actually representative of fluid flow. So Lagrangian processing is something where we would really track the flow of individual pixels, something like optical flow, where a lot of people might be familiar with. And on the other hand, Eulerian flow, you actually chop up the image into squares and you track the variations in each of these squares. So right here, what we're actually doing, we're actually taking this image and we're just looking at various different parts of it and we're seeing how they vary throughout the um, video. So this is a part of a paper called Eulerian Video Magnification. It's originally for motion magnification, but we can also use this technique to amplify color variations. And you can see right here, here's a sample of the results, and then here's a straight line taken across the face right here, and we can see in the original one how it varies, and in the amplified one how it varies. And we'll do a similar example of this in the notebook. So, and the source data comes from this page, which I'll link in the bio. And we can take any of these videos and see, we can just right click the source and download. So I'll link that. And I also have an article and we have the GIFs here. So this is the GIF of the video I just showed, but you can also see very faintly that this works on a darker, someone with a darker skin tone. It's a very faint to see. You have to use a higher amplification factor. Uh, I will link this article and it will show you how to do this. But this is gonna be a video version and we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into the code in this video. So right here, before we get started with the code, let's talk a little bit about how we do this. So this really relies on something called um, two main things. We have the Gaussian pyramid, which is gonna be a, a pretty basic computer vision um, concept that is gonna be leveraged for this and something called uh, temporal filtering. So if you're not familiar with signal processing, don't worry, I'm gonna show you in the code everything you need to know. So the first thing we do is we convert the video frames to the YIQ color space. So this is a different color space where you have a Luma channel, which is basically the intensity and an I and a Q channel. We don't need to do this, but this is how they did it in the paper. So you can look at this Wikipedia, art, this Wikipedia article for more information. And then the next thing we do is we get a Gaussian pyramid level. So we don't take the full Gaussian pyramid. We Gauss it, we basically go down to a certain level to basic, so, we take this original frame and we take it down a couple notches and we'll show that in code. And then we perform our bandpass filtering and then we magnify the filtered pyramid levels. Then we resize and add them back to the original frames and then we convert back to RGB. So I know that was a little fast. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna show you everything in the notebook. So let's pull up the notebook. And by the way, this notebook will be linked in the bio. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna import our libraries. Nothing too crazy here. We're mainly using OpenCV and NumPy and matplotlib to show everything. And of course, we're gonna use the glob and OS to find our data. So I have downloaded these videos and placed them in a location. You can do the same. And I'm just gonna use the basic face video and then we're going to make sure we get that. Now we're going to look at hyperparameters and we're going to come back to them. So this is the alpha parameter. This is the video magnification factor. If we set it to one, we're not going to get anything. I'm using a 50x magnification and I thought that was sufficient for this thing that I'm using. And now I am using this Gaussian pyramid level. So this basically sets the, uh, sets the level of the Gaussian pyramid and what this does is we're going to Gaussian down to, here, let me just pull up a visual. So what we're doing here, wow, where did this go? So right here, so we're going one, two, three, four. 
or four right here. So we basically get a blurred down sample. And what this does, this averages out all the noise. So when we apply our amplification, we don't amplify the noise, we amplify the pure signal of what we want. So it's another way to extract signal from the noise. And the second way we're going to extract that signal is to filter the out-of-band noise. And that, cor that corresponds to this temporal filtering, which I will show you in just a second. So speaking of temporal filtering, we have the low and high frequencies. So let's see right here. So we have 50 divided by 60. We're just keeping these in terms of seconds, 60 divided by 60. So we have the 0.83 to one Hertz. So in terms of beats per minute, I believe this is gonna be 50 beats per minute to 60 beats per minute. It's a pretty narrow band. Most heart rate detections actually go from 0.4 to, yeah, I think it's 0.4 to four Hertz. And that corresponds to this amount of beats per minute. Oh, I forgot the comma. So most heart rate detection algorithms go from 224 to 240. This is not intended to be a heart rate detection, but we could actually use it for it. So that's going to be something we'll cover in a future video. So next we can do any manual overriding of the frame sampling rate. And this will, we'll see why this is important later, but for now we're not going to worry about it. And the scale factor. So if we have large frames and want to save memory, make things faster, we could actually scale everything down to make everything a little bit easier. So right here we have our color space functions. Now I've covered this in my phase-based magnification video. I will also link that in the bio if you're interested. So this is a numpy version of the ColorSys libraries implementation of RGB to YIQ color space. It just makes it faster and more efficient um, right here is very similar. Only thing we're doing is we start with the BGR image. We convert that to RGB and then run this function up here. And right here we do the inverse. We go to YIQ to RGB. Once again, this is a numpy version of the ColorSys implementation. And then right here is a little lambda function to go from our YIQ color space to UNT8 um, RGB. And this is uh, mainly for convenience. So we're going to go ahead and get those and now right here we're going to stream the frames using OpenCV so we can get the video sampling rate like this. Um, sometimes the video isn't saved with the true sampling rate so for example there are some occasions where we might have a true sampling rate of 100 frames per second something really fast but it actually streams at about 30 frames per second according to this so sometimes we might need to override that if we have this information and that is what these parameters are doing. We would set the manual FS to like 100 or whatnot, but we don't have to worry about it for these videos. Just know that that is a thing and it could cause problems if you're not aware. So right here, we get our frames, scale it if we need to, get our width and height. We convert it to YIQ color space and it's very important that we normalize by 255 and convert to a float 32. And then we stay, save our frames right here and we want to resize them to our desired width and height from our scale factor. In this case, this doesn't matter because we're not using a scale factor. And then we destroy the cap and move on to the next one. So we, our video, I've already ran that cell. Our video has 301 frames. And here are some statistics. We have the Y channel goes from zero to one. And I believe these go from negative point five or I'm not exactly sure. We could look at the article, but these go from, I think they stop at 0.5. So in reality, we don't need to actually do all these channels. Most of the information is stored in the Y channel. So we can just do an example, frames zero, TM show. Oh. So this is the first frame right here. And this is in the YIQ map to RGB color space. And this is the the Y channel, this is the I channel, and this is the Q channel. But most of the information is stored in the Y channel. This is um, a little bit better than using a grayscale image. It has a better dynamic range. So right here, if we have any issues with the manual sampling rate, we're just going to use the standard one that comes with the video, um, 30 frames per second. And now let's get this to, to the temporal filtering. So what is temporal filtering? And what is a temporal signal is what we first need to ask ourselves. So we're going back to this um, Eulerian video magnification. We could see that right here, if we chop this image up, and we're actually going to do this with every single pixel, but if you assume these are our pixels, we have a value at, say, this pixel right here at um, 0, 1, and 0, 1 at 1, 1. That's going to vary over time as we go through the video. 
and I actually have a sample of this. So let's just go all the way down to where we first started, skip ahead, and right here. So this, well actually, let's take this right here. This is the value of a pixel at 1220 in our original image, and we could see how this value changes throughout the video. And I've actually normalized this by the mean to bring it down a level to um, plot it with this filtered value right here. So what this is right here is we could actually, and this is the pyramid. So we could see that just because I brought it down doesn't change the shape. It just, just basically brings it down from here to another, another spot. But this is going to vary over time. And when we temporally we could temporally filter, we could actually pull out the sinusoids that that make up the signal. So if we go right here, we could see that it varies sinusoidally at these peaks. There's peaks right here, 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 and it's sinusoidal. And we go up to another peak here, 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 here. and we could see that if we could find a way to get that sinusoid out, we could actually do this with temporal filtering. And this is based on Fourier's theorem that a continuous signal that's at least periodic has made up of sinusoids. So look at Fourier theorem. So we can base we can look this up, but you can see that a sinusoid is made up of a square wave, for example, is made up of an infinite amount of sinusoids. And it just turns out that a lot of signals, a lot of practical signals are composed of sinusoids, even if they're not perfectly periodic like the one that we're seeing here. So let's go back up and see how to actually extract these signals from that noisy data that we just saw. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called a finite impulse response filter. So basically, the finite impulse response filter, it means that its frequency response goes to zero in an infinite and a finite amount of time. And it might be a little bit difficult to understand, just basically know that you know we have this, we filter this amount of energy and frequency space, and then we snap down close to zero, as opposed to, well, let's actually pull up a sample. So if I R versus I R filters, I R filters are infinite impulse response filters. So there's no, no pictures here. All right, so right here, this is all I wanted to show you. Now, right here. If I could just find a way. So right here is the, the blue is the infinite impulse response filter. You can see it goes down to a very small value, negative 60, negative 70 is very close to zero. But this infinite impulse response filter never really goes down to zero. So that's basically it. We're going to use an IIR filters are not typically as good, but they're more efficient and better for real time applications and you can implement them in hardware, but finite impulse response filters tend to offer better results. And that's what we're going to use since we're not really trying to do this in real time. We're just doing this as a post processing technique. So what we do is we have the number of taps, which is basically how long our filter is, our cutoff. So this is our bandwidth that we're looking to filter, the sampling rate of the video, and then pass zero. If we put this as true, it basically inverts this filter. So we're going to go ahead and hit this. We're going to do, do the filtering in the frequency domain. So we take the FFT of our filter to get this transfer function, which we can plot right here. And we can see this lobe right here is going to be the it's going to be the positive frequencies. Then we have the negative frequencies kind of flipped around out here via the IFFT function, IF, IFFT shift function right here. So we're going to basically get two peaks right here, and we're going to notch everything else out in frequency space. Uh, this is called the impulse response of the filter. It's the time domain response, but we're not really worried about the time domain. For our purposes, it's easier to think of this in frequency domain. So we're going to do this right here to plot the frequency response of the filter. This is phase response. We're not exactly interested in that in this case. So right here, we have the 0.8 to 1.0 bands that we're interested in. And we could see that our filter actually perfectly encompasses these bands with this main lobe right here and then notches out everything else in frequency. And remember that this is going to be the log of it. So in case you want to see something, 
see how it really varies without the logarithm. We're just going to cheat for success and plot this right here. Let's, not, let's get these two things out of here. And you can see that it really does snap everything else down. But when I do the logarithm, this actually makes it a little bit easier to see what exactly is going on. So that's why I plot the log. Okay, so next we want to get the Gaussian pyramid. All right, so we have the a function for the Gaussian pyramid. This basically selects a single level that we are interested in. So remember, we wanted to get a single level. So we're not actually stacking these up. We're only getting one down sampled level. And it basically, it's a way to denoise the signal in our video. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to get something called the scale. And this is going to tell us which size the image, the final pyramid is going to be. So we basically take the level of interest, go two to the power of that. And then we start to iterate through the level. We pyramid down with the OpenCV pyramid down function, which gives us a downsampled image. We've explicitly passed D size, the D size argument. Usually we don't need this, but there's some edge cases where, think, where you know, different call and row values can mess things up. So we explicitly force this to be a certain value. And then we get the next set of col columns or rows to get the, for the next iteration. And then once we hit the level of interest, we could go through each color channel and stack up this pyramid in here. And then we can return the pyramid. So we do this for one image at a time. And then we set our we set our pyramid stack, and then we iterate through all the frames, get the pyramid, and then add it to our pyramid stack. So you can see that our pyramid stack is going to be number of frames, the color channels, and then the rows and columns. So here's an example of each color channel. That's the Y, I, Q. You can see that the Y channel has the most information. And just for reference, the pyramid stack, it's going to have, let's look at the dimensions. So we have 301 frames, three channels, and that's 37 by 33. So now we can apply our temporal filtering. So what we do is we take the FFT of our pyramid stack and we don't do this. This is, notice how this is not a 2D FFT. We are doing this temporally across the number of frames. So that, that is what this axis zero argument is doing. We're gonna cast it to a complex 64 since we don't need 128 bit precision for this. And then we simply multiply the FFT by our transfer function where we add dimensions and cast it to complex 64. And then we take the real part of the inverse FFT to get our final filtered pyramid. And notice how that happens pretty fast, even though we have 100 and, or 301 frames. And now let's see an example. So we're gonna look at an example of the frequency domain space of pixel 2012 in this picture. So we have right here 20 and then 12. So right here on the cheek, close to the nose, that's where the signal is going to be pretty high, but we could see that we do have the heart rate signal in the original frequency response. We have the DC right here, and then a lot of other stuff just spread out through across the spectrum. And once we filter everything out, we see that we're only left with the heart rate, which corresponds to this um, low frequency right here and the negative frequency that's flipped around here. So we can see that our temporal filter is actually working. So let's go ahead and see the difference between the unfiltered and the filtered limit channel at a single time instance. In this case, this is frame 10. We can see frame 100. And you can see that this does actually change throughout time, even though this one is gonna stay the same. So we could go 50. So that once again changed. So this is actually gonna vary from low to high as we go throughout. And actually, I will show you an example of what happens when we take the filtered channels. So when we take the filtered channels, amplify them, and then convert them back to RGB space, this is what we get. You can see that we are actually amplifying the color variation, even though we don't really get a lot of fine image details. When we add this back in, we are gonna get a nice resulting video where the true color is amplified. So let's go on to see how to do that. So 
We went over this previously. This is a plot of the pyramid stack. We have this plotted down here, and we can actually see how our temporal filtering was able to pull out a nice sinusoidal signal that actually corresponds to peaks in the real signal. Now, if you go through this, you can see that this peak right here corresponds to this right here, this one 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 to this, and you know, so forth. And this other, this other, you know, this, you have these high frequency stuff right here, and then this low frequency variation that makes it rise up like that. So next, all we got to do is multiply by our alpha factor. And that's this video we just saw right here where we see this amplified version right here. We scaled it by the alpha, converted back to RGB, and now we have a nice version of our amplified video. So we do that, and now we can actually store our magnified video frame. So we iterate through the frames, we get the YIQ channels of the original frames, and then the resized YIQ channels of the magnified pyramid frames, and we simply add them together, use the dstack function to add the, to concatenate them channel-wise, we get the mag magnified frame, we invert the color space back to RGB, and then we store them. And then this video right here is called Magnified Only, where we stack up the amplified, the resized amplified channel frames that give us this thing right here. All right, so let's do something right here. We're going to look at the detected heart rate. So we're going to go, once again, through the iterated number of frames. Now, this is just for example. We're going to get the original reds, blues, and greens, and we're going to get the magnified reds, blues, and greens. So we're going to compare. Now, remember, magnified is in YIQ color space, so we don't need to invert anything. And now we're going to get a times vector. So this video is about 10 seconds long. We take the number of frames, divide by the sample rate to get the seconds. So since sample rate is 1 over seconds, dividing it gives us units of seconds, and then we can plot it. So we could see the red, blue, and green variations. Now this is the sum. We're not normalizing anything. But we could see for each channel at each timestamp, we get a basically constant thing right here. And on the same scale, we can see this filtered version right here. There's a clear sinusoid, sinusoid, and this corresponds to the heart rate that we've just extracted from the video. So let's go ahead. We're going to view the, the frequency spectrum. And right here, we're just taking the real FFT. Um, we're getting the free frequencies right here. All right, this is where we're taking the real FFT, absolute value, normalizing it by the number of frames. And right here, we're getting the frequencies. So we're using the RFFT freq to go from 0 to 0.5, scaling it by the sample rate to get the actual frequencies. Since the Nyquist theorem basically says that we can resolve frequencies at half the sample rate, the max frequency is going to be about 15. And it, our sample rate was 30, which we see here. But we can see that we filtered out basically everything. We still have some DC right here. And we can see that we have a very, very strong component in our amplified frequency band. That is what we want. So if we run this peak finding algorithm right here, we can see that we have a clear peak at 0.897. And in beats per minute, all we got to do is multiply that by 60, and we get 53.8 beats per minute. So that is the average heart rate, or I don't, I don't want to say average, it's kind of a strong word, but that is the heart rate that we have detected over this 10-second interval in this video. And we could do this to any video as long as we could detect the face and there's good lighting. If the lighting is not good, we're not going to get a very strong signal, and we might not be able to get a reliable reading. So right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the stacked frame. So we have left frame is the original. The right side of the frame is the amplified. Right here, I put this middle thing right here, so this gives a nice line between these two images. So I take the OG frame, I normalize it accordingly, and I use the H stack function to get the original and the magnified frames together. I add it to this list of stacked frames, and now I've displayed it in RGB. So this final part right here is now we get the stacked frames, use the OpenCV video writer and write it to the video. And we've already done that. You've already seen that video. Um, right here, same thing. We're just at the magnified frames that we can see right here. That is how you make this video. Um, just go, I encourage you to go through the notebook and read through the code. It's uh, pretty pretty um, simple stuff. You com or Leave a comment if you have any questions about it. So right here, similar thing right here, we're just making a GIF right here. You can leave a comment if you have any questions or any issues with this. I also have the notebook linked on GitHub. And right here, we're going to do something where we visualize the amplification. So right here, we're going to look at three locations where the signals are strong. We're going to see this line right here on the forehead and these two lines on the cheeks. And in general, in most heart rate detection 
algorithms. It's called a remote PPG. They usually detect the face, um, get facial key points, and then extract these certain parts on the image. So right here, we have some code to look at the full image. So this is kind of, this is a line basically down the middle. You can see right here actually corresponds to the lips. And then we see how the fa how it changes over time. You can see there's a clear sinusoidal variation. But now let's look at the forehead. Um, same thing right here, clear sinusoidal variation. And then down here, there's left cheek and right cheek. You can see there's a very, very high signal right here, clear sinusoidal variation, which is what we're looking for. So that's really all there is to it. Um, I know this video is a little bit long for what we did. I do have a code, some code right here. Um, it's actually this one right here. It's called color map. I have all the functions in here. I have arguments, and then it basically goes through the same things that we just went through, except it does it in a script that you can call from the command line. So this will also be on the GitHub. So it's all for this. I will see you all in the next one.